not just a political point, in fact, um, that the banking inquiry had been fla fatally flawed. So he might avail of the opportunity at some stage over the next while to explain whether that was just a, per a personal view or uh, indeed uh, the view of his party on uh, the workings of the banking inquiry. Thank you, Leskin. Good morning, Margaret. Uh, Hyakta, I now call Deputy Brian Stanley. Joining to speak on this uh, legislation and uh, I want to thank Deputy Dyle for bringing it forward. Uh, the legislation makes it statutory uh, for elections, for polling stations at elections within the state to, to open from 7 to 7 o'clock in the morning until 10 in the evening. Uh, we believe we should even go further and have, it, have a weekend voting. Um, what we want to do is uh, provide people who wish to vote uh, a longer time frame within which to exercise their, their franchise. It means people can vote before going to work um, and after work, people who work odd hours or people who work shifts. But I do think this is a, a significant step in the right direction. Uh, the argument, there's an argument in favour of extending uh, open hours to polling stations that would increase turnout. But as you know, that does not always, there's not always a correlation between those two, uh, those two factors. Uh, turnout in the 1990, 1997 general election was 76.5%. Turnout in the last general election, when polling stations were open at 7 a.m., was 70 per cent, which is down, down significantly. Um, however, I, I don't think that ought to be the determining factor uh, in whether it should be longer open hours or not. It's more to do with facilitating people, <coughs> facilitating people to, edge, to exercise their franchise, whether to, to choose to do so or not to themselves. But voting, voting should be made more user-friendly uh, where possible. There's also a number of other issues which might be considered uh, to widen the democratic nature of elections. Uh, and we support the extension of the franchise to all citizens over the age of 16 years. People of that age are already fully, participate, fully participating citizens uh, through the education system. Indeed, many of them will be working and have a valid right to be consulted through the democratic process and allowed to vote in the uh, European general local elections and referenda. We'd also like to see people in the, in the six counties uh, being allowed to vote in the presidential elections and in Shannon elections. Uh, we, after all, we've had a president uh, from Belfast, Mary McAleese, and I think uh, just general agreement, insofar as you can have general agreement on these matters, that she's done a, done a good job and that she was a good, a good president. And in the case of my own party, we nominated Martin McGuinness from Derry. So if we can nominate people from the six counties, we should, people in the six counties should be able to vote. And I think it's important to note as well that the president is, and uh, successive presidents, including the current one, Michael D. Higgins, has said that he's a president for all of the Irish people. There's also a strong case to be made for providing emigrants uh, with some means of exercising their franchise. There are 115 states, including a lot of uh, developed democracies, uh, do so. And you were familiar with seeing uh, news reports of American citizens uh, and the citizens of other states who are living here going to their embassies and to cast, to cast their ballot. So there surely must be a similar mechanism to allow uh, our immigrants to be enfranchised. The whole issue of the electoral register has been raised, and this is a bugbear of mine, how accurate it is. Uh, even in the street I, I live in, uh, and in the previous one I lived in when I was councillor, and I can assure you I would have strived to have it fairly accurate, uh, I was never able to get more than about 95% accurate. But many, ad many adults are not on it, uh, or on it at the wrong address, while there are other individuals who are on it two and three times. And that's a constant battle trying to, somebody mentioned the ratepayers, councillors try to do it now I suppose, you know, where you see somebody on the register two or three times, you bring it to the attention of officials. But the system is, you know, having people to their address and relying on that is hugely inaccurate, Minister. And I know we've had this conversation before about this. We need to, we need to just have it to the person. And it, the only feasible way that I can see of doing it is through the PPS number. I know the issue of um, data protection comes up when you mentioned this, but there must be some way through modern technology and modern IT of getting the person up via their PPS number and then putting the PIN number beside them or 
putting their electoral electro register roll number beside them as we do at present. You know, but what it would do is ensure that people are not on it two or three times. Um, you know, every election you go to canvas, you can see that there's people, yeah, that's the same person, they're registered at two or three different addresses. And, you know, it's not, it's, that's not acceptable. And we have to try and, uh, we have to try and correct that. I think it's the, it's the way that to ensure as well that when people reach 18 years of age that would automatically go on the register. And people could check it every year. If they didn't then, it is their own fault if they check it, if they don't check it every year to see already on it. But I had people now again at this election, uh, people who have been registered to vote for years, haven't moved house, haven't been out of the country, haven't moved out of the house they're living in, no change, went to go vote as they did in 2011, they vo voted in the most recent referendum last year, and they went to vote this year in the local elections, and they're, off to, they're not on the register of elections. You know, so we don't have a good system. We have a shambolic system, and we need to change it. We need, need to ensure that people are only on it, on it once, but they, that they are on it. And we need to encourage more young people to vote. And I think that the um, PPS number would help to safeguard against, against fraud, uh, and that you, you would have a more, uh, I suppose, a better democratic process. Also, in relation to registration, we should establish uh, some kind of electoral commission. And I think your government are committed to doing this. Um, but we should push ahead with that, and uh, that should be responsible for voter registration, voter education. It could be improved by making the electoral and overall political system an integral part of the CPSE course in second level schools. Now, that depends on the local teacher at the moment. Have they got an interest in it? Some of them have, some of them haven't. But we need, to, we need to put that in there as part of the programme. The Commission would have the task of maximising voter turnout and numbers contesting all tiers of representation, including the development of programmes of, uh, for proactive uh, registration and increased participation by traditionally underrepresented groups. The Electoral Commission should also take on the responsibilities currently held by the Constituency Commission, SIPO and Referendum Commission. The, ori the original function of this which required a referendum commission to set out the pros and cons of a referendum proposal, that should be restored. We've all seen the contentious issues that have been put to referendum in recent years and are familiar with the claims, justified in my, in, in, in my view, that, that some European referendums that, that allegedly, allegedly unbiased information was used was anything but unbiased. We support the introduction of larger seven-seat constituencies, not more TDs, same number of TDs, but larger five, six, and seven-seater constituencies. And that would help, uh, it would help to have a better representation within this House, and it would ensure that smaller parties and independents were provided with a better opportunity to win seats. And the Labour Party, I think, might look seriously at this uh, for the next election. It would certainly uh, you know, help them because they are at a disadvantage, the same as we are to some extent, that uh, you're contesting and the, the system as it is militates against smaller parties. So alongside the bigger constituency, constituencies, there might also be consideration given the inter introduction of a partial list system based on proportional representation. The list systems are common across other European states and, you know, we're we're fond of saying let's do things the European way. So here's one thing we could do the European way. Uh, and the people, party support could be measured on the basis of party preference rather than, being, rather than being totally influenced by individual candidates. And that might go some way to reduce and also the so-called parish pump influence, which many people criticise as a factor in Irish politics. But finally, I would like to, to reiterate my support for the bill, uh, which I assume will be given the authors um, support for the government and member of the government party uh, that, it, that it will uh, move ahead and will be given a fair wind but I think it's a positive move in the right direction but we do need we do need to have uh, polling stations open I think uh, I would suggest that Saturday is a better day for polling stations and you know we must think about students students and people who work away from home I know several people who you know who miss voting because to work up the country or down the country students who can't get home for it and I think it's very important that we enable them to do so um, I think that the issue as well of people on holidays there's a very simple good system could be put in place you know uh, the elections in the case of local elections it's known years in, in, in advance when they're going to be 
So there's a very simple thing we could do, even for general elections, is that the local county council offices could accept indiv individuals into vote. Uh, for, exa for example, if you have your holiday booked for the 23rd of May this year, and um, uh, you're off on holidays on that day, you're going to America or wherever else, or going to England, and you're not here to vote, very simple, a fortnight beforehand or three weeks beforehand, you should be able to go into your council offices, meet one of the people from franchise, bring in your ID, they check the register that you're on it, they cut you it. off the register, and that register goes out to the polling station shows showing that you already have voted. So that, that, that shouldn't be beyond our ability to do that, but I think it's very unfair that people, and I met several people, I'm sure everyone here did, in the recent election, that couldn't vote because they said, oh God, the 23rd, we're away on that day. And particularly when it's one of your supporters, you know. Thank you, Deputy. What a vote for you is a terrible thing. So you might just look at that. Deputy Sean Crow. Again, can I uh, thank the, uh, the, the uh, author of the, today's bill? And I, I think it has raised, uh, you know, it's a good debate. Um, I think we're all interested in, in this debate because it's, it's, uh, it's so important to us, but it's also so important to uh, um, democracy. It's important to our communities. And it, it, I suppose it's, uh, if, we're, if we're really serious about the whole idea of participation and uh, uh, people being involved in politics and so on, it's, a, it, it's, uh, it's vital that we get this right. Uh, I was listening to the Minister, you, you were saying about uh, some of the thing about, you know, this thing of uh, greater voter participation. Uh, I think, again, we'd all agree with that. And, we, you know, I, I suppose as different parties, we've all trying to... Uh, enhance the whole process by getting more people involved by by encouraging more people to to register and get involved and i would i want to use this opportunity for instance to commend like the likes of the vincentian partnership who do a lot of outreach uh, work to uh, a lot of marginalized community a lot of marginalized groups and try to get them on the register and try to encourage them and they've done it in, in my own constituency a lot the new Irish, and they've they've brought them along and they've had guards there and they've got people registered and so on but it's also to bring them part of it and make them feel part of it and explain to them and in some cases they brought in candidates and there's been debates and so on and that has helped uh, create some sort of interest within those groups itself in relation to the participation i think one of the vital areas is that you know there was talk about uh, the, the the locations itself and some speakers were saying about schools you know for a lot of a lot of people in ireland and depending on your generation school wasn't a very uh, for for a lot of people it wasn't a very uh, happy period in their lives and there's you know there's still this so vicious and there's still this uh, reluctance a lot of people that were t were talking uh, and I've, I've met people on the doors and they're not they're not particularly happy and particularly those who have literacy problems and again it's the officious thing there's a guard on the door there used to be and you know to go in and you have id and all this and people that haven't done it it's not very welcoming for them i think it'd be more welcoming in the likes of community centers where they're more in you know they're they're probably more regularly going in rather than the schools themselves so again that that's something that can be looked at but we need to be opening up and that there needs to be uh, where it's best where where it's located best i'll give an example of the last election um, one, one of the schools that was used, the Holy Rosary schools in Ballycra, um, it turned out that on the day of the election, it was actually a building site. So, Minister, what, what happened on the day was that anyone that had a difficulty in walking or, you know, someone in a wheelchair couldn't access the polling station. Now, there was another school in uh, Dunleary, and again, there was uh, difficulty there for people to access. And in the end, local residents actually put, or some, some people put together a ramp, a homemade ramp. Now, the, the, the staff and they were saying, oh, we can't get involved uh, for health and safety. But the, anyway, they put it in. But the, the difficulty in the, the, the Valley Cross School, the Holy Rosary School, was um, that there was, there was no way to access it. There was actually a sign uh, pointing through a hedge and there was a, you know, you know it's, it sounds like Father Ted stuff, you know, that, you know, you know, you could, I've actually photographs of it. The sign pointing through a hedge to people, you, know, you went through the hedge then and, the, and you were onto a gravel footpath. And you were, you, like, the, 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 the pole took part and, you know, it, it ended up at, uh, at night time was dark, no lighting. 
and you had to walk from here to the end of the house. So you're talking about a huge distance. So those people there that were battling their legs or that were in wheelchair couldn't vote. Tried to contact the, the sheriff's office, you couldn't get through. Uh, email went sent. I got a re reply back and he was apologetic and so on. So no, no point in apologising to me. It's the people that didn't have a vote. Like, what about them, you know? And so, like I said, like in future, you know, they should have went out the day before and, you know, it, it, there was, they were promised that the walks would have been carried out and so on, but it wasn't done. And I, I, I think that's a scandal. And that should never happen and shouldn't happen and we need to put in structures in relation to it. The minister talked about alienation from the political system and so on, the Lisbon Treaty, the quotes there in relation to it. You also had the relation to, you know, there was other factors there that, you know, uh, because of the no vote, you know, there's a bit, you know, a lot of stuff in the media, everyone was coming out. Uh, it was the, like, uh, what was the, the, the um, cartoon, the... Uh, Chicken Little, the sky is falling type of thing. Oh, he's going to have to. And anyway, there was a, a larger turnout, and a lot of people that voted the first time didn't vote the second time because they said, "Well, how many? How often do you have to say no in relation to that?" So you know, yes, and and things like that do, do do um, affect people. There is a disconnect there in, in society in relation to politics, and again, I, I argue that making it simpler, uh, people are talking about the register. Um, again, I don't know if this house will be surprised, but I remember the 2011 or 2007 election where I lost me. See, there was actually four and a half thousand when the draft register was taken in West Tallet alone. There was four and a half thousand people removed off the register. There was whole estates removed at that time. A scandal stuff now, and I, I again, you know, many of us that were active in that election were going to the council and saying, trying to find out who did you remove off? Oh, we can't give you that information. I ended up going to the minister of the day at the time, was a discussion in this house, and uh, it was instructed that we were to get a list of it. Anyway, there was about 2,000 put back on the, the list. But there was two and a half thousand. But there was whole estates minister. Now, you know, this is supposed to be updating the register. Not, it's not supposed to be we're removing people off the register. And that, to this day, is still a problem. If someone knocks on the door, if there's no one there, in some cases, that, that individual or that household can be removed off the register. And if we go through the register, we all know of cases where we go through the register and pe families have been removed off it. And to this day, we don't know, but usually when people find out is on the day they go down to the, the, the electorate. Other, other, other situations are bizarre as well. I've had a case there, it was a traveller woman. It was the first time she ever voted in her life. I think her name was Mary Elizabeth or Elizabeth Ann. And our, our ID was uh, Anne Elizabeth, and she wasn't allowed, you know, the presiding officer wasn't allowed in that, allowing that woman to vote. Now, crazy stuff, you know. Um, I had another one there where um, there was a young man, and his ID, the address was uh, one estate, and uh, the polling card went to another. And again, there was a problem there because the ID didn't match with the address on the thing. Now, come on, you know, like, you go, well, you know, again, you can go to the presiding officer and argue with it, but these are simple things. These are, you know, we should be encouraging, you know, it's about encouraging more people involvement. And I, I, I'll move on to the next step down. I was talking to people in the, uh, on the BIPA thing, and they were talking about British jurisdiction, and they were saying about the postal votes, how important it is for their own system now. And it's, you know, it's, we've gone the opposite way. It's, it's harder and harder to get a postal vote. And people were talking about holidays and so on. And they've sort of much more flexibility in their system. They've, they've a system where you can, you can operate a proxy that you can actually get someone to do it. So, just, we, you know, they've, they've, they've actually tried to uh, adapt their system to make it more voter friendly. And I would argue that we need to do the same in relation to, to that. Um, others talked in terms of the, the diaspora vote and how important that would be, and that's part of it that came out of the Constitutional Convention. And it was interesting, the, the, the figures that were quoted about this, the setting up the Electoral Commission. I, I imagine if there was an Electoral Commission there that, um, for instance, the case of the school in Ballycra where the, the people, you know, people, w I presume they would, uh, you know, put in place instructions to every local authority that come the next election, do you come out and actually inspect it? 
the, the site of where that's going to be. And if we find it's not suitable, well, it's alternative arrangements down the road. Or, like, there's a lot of halls there, there's a lot of centres, there's a lot of things that we can actually be flexible on. So, again, I want to thank uh, the, the, the mover of, t of, t of today's motion. It is about, um, I agree with the Minister, you know, there needs to be probably uh, greater flexibility in relation to time, but we need to be, uh, it would be helpful, I think, a fixed time, a fixed day. Um, I do think, you know, there, there has been uh, elections in the past where it's been difficult for students or workers, you know, to be tr back in the constituency. And again, I, I think, um, the time limit, Minister, um, most, most presiding officers you talk to, they, they reckon that the seven o'clock is not really much use to any shift workers you know that and um, it would probably be more helpful it was half six it gives you that bit of a leeway in relation you know i know it's longer days and um, some people say well half ten i would prefer if it was earlier rather than later in relation to it. and again that's my op just my opinion but i think that would be helpful uh, at the seven o'clock is just uh, not not you know i doesn't i doesn't really live up to it and um, so uh, again uh thank to thank to mover um, i think there's a lot of a, a lot you know i think i think this is the start of the debate not rather than the end of it i think we need to keep working on this and uh, to refine to you know to make it better but thank i'm you. glad we're actually having it for the first time we're having the debate and well done good morning thank you deputy uh deputy noel harrington and bernard Rocker, the last two speakers and I'd ask them to be brief because the minister has to call it 140, I think. 137. Yeah. Uh, Deputy Harris. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Lasky and Corla. Uh, uh, I'll be, I won't use the full time, obviously, but I just want to thank uh, Deputy Andrew Doyle and commend him for uh, uh, putting forward this bill on polling, polling times. And I think um, allowing certainty or giving certainty uh, to uh, voters on polling times, I think, is very important. Um, I particularly want to, to, to use the opportunity to mention those that don't work nine to five jobs, many of those in rural areas, uh, particularly in summertime. Uh, for example, in the farming sector, they'd essentially be working from dawn to dusk and um, not knowing under those circumstances, well, is the polling station opening at 8 or is it half 8 or is it 9, is it 7 o'clock in the morning, when is it closing, is it 9 o'clock in the evening, is it 10 o'clock, I think, giving uh, absolute certainty as to the opening and closing times of polling stations in all elections um, would be particularly helpful for those uh, who, work, who work the land particularly in the summertime, but also for uh, some of the communities that I represent, um, who, um, the fishing communities, whose, whose working times are dictated by many other issues like tides and, and issues like that, they would welcome uh, the idea that there'd be greater certainty with uh, polling times. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that you are providing for a very long day for polling staff, uh, but um, my experience speaking with polling clerks, presiding officers, etc., is they're quite happy uh, to work the long hours uh, that that day presents. What really makes their job difficult is some of the issues that have been described by many of the, many of the previous uh, speakers here. And unfortunately, every election that, that I've either participated in or um, I suppose in some ways been a part of over the last number of years, from about 11 o'clock in the morning on, you invariably get the phone calls and the texts and the Facebook um, uh, announcements of uh, people who legitimately went to their polling station and found out that they were not on the electoral register. Uh, with a very unfortunate case in my area where one, a person, one person uh, moved home and it seems the entire family of eligible voters uh, were uh, struck from the electoral register and it, it caused huge uh, distress for a family that never failed uh, to vote. Now, the idea that you know the responsibility is on individual electors to check the register themselves um, is, is, a, is valid. However, I think um, the operation of the electoral register, as we, as we have seen, uh, you know, does leave a lot to be desired. And I think there's a very good opportunity, Minister, in particular, for example, under the, under the, new, um, the new regime for, for water charges. I mean, we now know the households. We never had a database since 1977 of households in this country, really. We have a, uh, we have a database now building up because of the household charge, the NPPR and the property tax, etc. In particular now with the water charges as well, not only do we have the households, we have those that are uh, over and under 18 within those households. And it beggars belief that 
in every engagement that a citizen has with the state, whether it's through their health services or through their uh, state services or other state agencies, that there isn't some part of an application process or some box to tick that we could cross-reference that application or that uh, citizen's effort or engagement with the state with uh, the franchise offices of the various local authorities or through the Department of the Environment. It just defies logic. Um, we could include or exclude people on an ongoing basis and not have to spend so much time and resources coming up to elections advertising the fact that if you're not on the register, uh, you can't vote. Um, I think there's opportunities through social media and, and, and others, but I think yeah, you know, cross-referencing state agencies and government departments with the franchise offices um, has to ratchet up. And, it, and it should be able, we should be able to do it now under, under the new um, uh, local authority charges that, are, that, that have, have been uh, introduced and will be uh, fleshed out over the next number of months. Um, the alignment of the Euro elections to local elections will have to continue. And my, you know, I mean, that goes without saying. I don't, I shudder to think turnout on Euro elections would be if they hadn't been uh, or they were not aligned to local elections. And, uh, you know, maybe we could go further in, 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 in securing greater participation in our Euro elections. Um, one of the issues I think I feel very strongly about is the, is the distribution of the polling cards. The polling cards come at a time when the litter on Thaukan from every other candidate comes through the letterbox. And along with all the different publicity post circulars about free hearing aids and um, um, discard your old clothes and all the rest of it, the polling card comes in indistinguishable from junk mail. And I think uh, it would be far better and a, a, a greater uh, engagement if the polling card would arrive by post in an envelope addressed to the, the voter. Far too often the, the, polling card, the polling card is filed under the same uh, filing cabinet as all the other uh, junk mail items that come through the letterbox are filed and then when people are looking for them they're not sure whether they're on the register or whether they got a polling card or they didn't and it's particularly true as well for those that are visually impaired. And I would suggest that uh, those that are visually impaired are indeed totally, totally blind. I, how do they know? If we, you know, I mean, could we, could, could we not do something to help, whether to be some kind of an embossed envelope uh, for those that are visually impaired to, 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 to inform them that what they have in their hand is not a request to throw out all their used clothes or that they have, an off, they have a great new offer for new hearing aids or whatever the case may be, but they have the, their polling card in their hand. Um, we, we, it was announced obviously yesterday, and it, maybe it's a bit timely, um, Minister Ring announced um, uh, the, uh, the Sports Capital Grant. And I just want to bear with, if, if you would bear with me a second. And the point he made in the Sports Capital Grant very strongly was that each of the different areas got their grants on a per capita pro rata basis on, on population. And I'm just wondering, and I, I, I might be a bit facetious here, but things like the Sports Capital Grant, if they were allocated on a voter turnout basis, uh, for all the different areas, I wonder would would it would it open up a better discussion about the the, the benefits and the advantages, or vice versa, of uh, poor voter participation? Um, other countries do different do it differently. They have mandatory voting, or they pe they financially penalise those that can't give a reasonable justification as why they don't show up at the polling station. Uh, but uh, we don't have a, a relatively poor voter turnout. But I think as as politicians, it's always heartening and it's, it gives a greater mandate when you have a strong uh, polling, uh, a strong voter participation and I think anything that can be done in that regard should be, um, should be considered. And finally, uh, last count Corda, just to address, I was disappointed to, to, to note the tenor of uh, Deputy Cowan's contribution when he, he could have been as spokesperson for the environment a little bit more proactive on his thoughts on, on electoral reform or particularly if he would if he if he gave any minute to addressing the actual bill that Deputy Doyle had introduced. Um, you know, I, I think
coming from uh, Deputy Cohen, uh, whose party, I suppose, you could you could easily argue was the least transparent. I mean, they they put a coach, they, they put a bulldozer through freedom of information legislation that was over the last number of years. Uh, they decimated local authorities when they abolished the uh, household rates back in 19, 1977, and it will take 75 years, in my opinion, for local authorities to catch up to provide the services that they should that that you would decently call modern day services. I would ask him uh, if he if he seriously believes uh, that um, that he has a greater insight or a greater claim to greater democracy uh, than, the, than this current government. And I would echo what uh, Deputy John Paul Phelan called for. Uh, you have a senior government spokesperson or a senior opposition spokesperson for the environment. Uh, um, Saying, stating in this chamber, in the Dáil, that he ha that the, the the banking inquiry is fatally flawed. Uh, that's the that's the kind of contribution that f that needs further clarification. And I would call on either Deputy Cohen or Deputy McGrath uh, to confirm what is Fianna Fáil's policy, what is their, their 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 position on the on the banking inquiry, as this is uh, uh, Dáil Éireann, and that committee is reflective of the of the. Um, the makeup of this doll, I would be quite content to see that that committee, as all other committees are, reflect the makeup of that doll. If he has a different idea, I think he needs to elaborate on that and not to further uh, damage the democratic process as he's railed against in this House. Thank you, Deputy. Now, we call Deputy Durkin. There's seven minutes remaining. Thank you, uh, Mr. Corda, and I would glad to have an opportunity to speak on this uh, particular uh, private member's bill in the Congress and State. Uh, my colleague, uh, Deputy Andrew Doyle, for being before the House, gives an opportunity to focus for a few moments on a very important part of our democratic system, the system of voting. I think there's merits in, in, in the, the setting up of times. Uh, starting, opening and closing times of the polling stations because it will give advance warning to people uh, without, without change of the time that they could expect to be there, effectively in the time within which they should be there to, in order to cast their vote. I'm not 100% certain as to whether or not there should be some provision made as to, uh, in cases where people uh, arrive at the polling station, possibly uh, late uh, or on time is sufficient to queue. I know that that happens if they get inside the polling station, but I just wonder if a person is waiting to vote and the station hasn't closed, whether provision should be made to accommodate them in those circumstances. I don't say that it should be wait open for five minutes, but if the person is at the polling station, and we've all seen people who have turned up at the polling station, when the door has closed, uh, uh, or as the door has closed. Now, generally speaking, uh, presiding officers will make, uh, will, will make allowances and, and accommodate, but not always. So I, I just wonder whether that should be uh, uh, put into the system as well. I'm, I'm not one of those people, Alaska and Corda, who, who calls for the simplification uh, of voting systems. Democracy is a very sacred thing, and it, it, there's a certain amount of ceremony attached to it, and so there should be, because it's the basic tenet of our democracy that the people vote, that they express their choice, and that they do so after careful consideration. And I, 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 I think there's a tendency in recent times, you know, to, for people to say, you know, let it be easier for everybody and let it be an open door and let people vote, you know, if they feel fit and so fit and so on and so forth. I think it's all nonsense. I think the responsibility on the voter to make a decision that is in a serious decision, arrived at seriously and not cynically. And cynicism is a dangerous thing in any democracy, as we have known if we read our history, particularly European history. Uh, it should serve to illustrate for us that, you know, being cynical doesn't solve any problems. But the most important factor, I think, is that when we vote, we have to relate the act of voting to the, the consequences afterwards outside. Every time we cast a vote, it's an important decision. It makes a decision as to who represents us the people, we the people, and we part that too, in our Legislative Assembly for the next foreseeable future. Now, people can dismiss that, and people do dismiss it from time to time, and say it's too complicated and it should be simpler and easier and all that kind of thing. There's nothing simple about democracy except one thing. If it fails, then we have serious consequences. So we should readily recognise the importance of ensuring that A, people have a registered divorce and, it, and, and because otherwise everything is incidental. Incidentally, 
and I've spoken about this, everybody else in this house has spoken about this many, many times in the past. I cannot understand for the life of me how with modern technology advances in, 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 in most every science that we know about, that it isn't possible to have an accurate vote, voters register. Various issues have been put forward from time to time, like use of the uh, uh, PPS number, etc. There's a simple thing to do, and it has to be done eventually, that is the post office. The post office is the one area which has uh, access to almost every house in the, in the country on a daily basis, and they should have, or if they haven't, they should have. But the point is this, that they are in a better position to monitor the voting register than anybody else. Anybody who looks at their voters registers on a county by county basis will come to the conclusion that in some cases, if the, the intervention is made, make it even worse. In some cases, whole swathes of people are taken off. In some cases, people who voted a year ago no longer have a vote. And somebody will tell you that, you know, we took a random sample and, uh, because the person was on holidays at the time the random sample was taken. Uh, uh, they, they've now gone off the register. But that's ridiculous uh, uh, nonsense to have. The other thing, and people have mentioned it already, uh, is this the question of the, the possible introduction of a list system. I am profoundly opposed to such a ridiculous system. And the fact that they use it across Europe is no recommendation whatsoever. The only thing that, has hap that happens with a list system is that people who would never get to, to be elected in, in, at all, because they couldn't get elected, will get, be elected to public office on the basis of a party's performance or somebody else's performance. I, I believe the system has no merit at all. There is only one system, to my mind, and that is the system whereby the individual votes for an individual. And that means if they're, if they're part of a party, well then so be it, or if they're not part of a party. They have that choice. A list system that says, well, in the second hand and the third hand, we'll have, we'll have a, a system, like for instance the replacement in, 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 in the European Parliament. I think it's a daft system. It's a ridiculous system where somebody who's, who, who's on the list automatically go, goes into position without, without being elected at all. I think it's utterly crazy. And the other thing I think is that, and I will, I, I, I'll finish with this, the other thing I think is important to know is this, is that by minimising the importance of voting, we diminish the importance of democracy. And we should never do that. We should never, ever attempt to minimise it. All we need to do is to go to countries that don't have democracy. Go to some of the countries worldwide over the past number of years that many of us have been sent to by the United Nations or by whosoever to monitor elections. And see the importance that people in those countries that have no democracy or have had no democracy attached to the act of voting. And they will queue up all morning for hours before the polling stations open at 7 o'clock and remain there at 12 o'clock the following, the following morning and afterwards uh, in order to get an opportunity to cast their vote because they regard it as hugely important that they participate in, every, in a very meaningful way in the act of voting and that of nominating the person who is about to represent them. And the last point I want to make on that is simply this. It may well be that the person who is elected to represent them doesn't represent them to the best of their ability or in the way that they should are not in the best interests of the nation. But the fact remains available to the same people to change that decision at the next opportunity. And it should always be part and parcel of our democratic system that we give opportunity, that we allow for change, and also the access to polling stations has been referred to already, and a few seconds left, can I, I only say this, we need to look very carefully to ensure that access to polling stations is dealt with in a meaningful way. I have uh, 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 visited one polling station in my own constituency in the most recent election. The polling booth was in the porch of a school. Uh, there was no lighting, no proper facilities for privacy or anything like that. I thought it was utterly ridiculous in this day and age. And I thank, uh, I thank my colleague again for having given me the opportunity to speak. And Good morning, sir. You have to now call on the Minister of State, Deputy Professor Dowd. Uh, I would listen with great interest to the debate today, and particularly, uh, I think, apart from one or two contributions, it was really a, a very positive, constructive engagement with what this stall should be all about. And we all share the same commitment to the democratic process and the desire to incur, or sorry, to increase voter participation. Obviously, there have been a lot of different views raised here today, lots of very interesting points, and all of them, no doubt, will have to be considered at the next stage of the debate on this bill. The essence we are debating is that a fixed polling period of 15 hours between 7 and 10 p 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. would lead to increased voter participation. And uh, I, 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 we heard all the arguments from both sides. Uh, but I think it's very important that we continue to be open to new ideas to promote greater voter participation. 
Uh, the government has been very active in the area of electoral reform and plans to continue in that vein. The establishment of the Electoral Commission is a further significant reform to which this government is absolutely committed. I have no doubt that the work involved in developing the Electoral Commission model will widen the debate on electoral matters, including, uh, including voter participation. I just want to refer to a few points, is that what we have done, in fact, in terms of electoral reform, uh, one particular important bit has been a ban on the acceptance of corporate donations over 200 euros unless their body has registered with the Standard Public Office Commission and the donor has declared to the recipient that the donation has been authorised by a general meeting of the members of the body concerned. A reduction in the limits on political donation by a political party from 6,300 to 2,500, by an individual from 2,500 to 1,000, a reduction in the thresholds of which donations must be reported by a political party from 5,000 to 1,500, by an individual from 634 to 600, a reduction in the threshold from 5,078 euro to 200, above which companies, trade unions, societies and building societies must report our political donations into annual accounts. I also want to say that uh, in terms of saving in the Litter and Telecom, we saved 3.8 million on the recent European elections by changing the basis from one letter uh, to one letter per household rather than to every single person who would be entitled to vote within the, that household. Finally, I want to congratulate Deputy Doyle and obviously his staff on the excellent work that they have done. And I think the, the, the significance of it all is that you have had an excellent debate here. I think there's very constructive, positive debates which will now go into the mix for further, for further development. And I, I welcome uh, the discussion today. I now call on, on Deputy Andrew Doyle. The composer um, of the bill. Thank you, Alaska and Corla. Could I first of all thank the Minister and all my colleagues here in the House for their uh, generally positive contribution to the debate. Um, no, could I just say, I, I said at the outset I was introducing uh, uh, this bill in the context of, of the government's commitment to doll reform and to political reform in general. Um, and I think with the exception of maybe Deputy Cowan, who unfortunately decided to get on, go on a tangent and, and bring in other issues, a Friday sitting like this, where you have more of a committee type of in atmosphere where people can actually have a rational debate without maybe some of the set pieces or the f more f um, media focus, does allow for uh, a, a better discussion, I feel. I did anticipate that something as fundamental to politicians as how people vote would generate some interest. I think it would be in all our interest to actually show some interest in this. I was tempted um, when considering it to include, say, for instance, that we should vote on a Saturday, something I personally favour. I didn't, um, you know, I, 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 d I decided to keep it very precise and, and, and very focused on just the hours of voting. And I set the hours down as as being the hours that are common. And one point that was made about it being very long hours, I have, as all of us do on, on polling day, gone around to several and as many polling booths as I can. I've we talk, talked to every presiding officer. And the hours are not what really is the issue. It's the turnout. The presiding officer will not, and, and the staff that work there, on polling day will tell you it's a long day if there's nobody there. If people are, con and they know the, the ebbs and flows of the political, the voting pattern during the day. But they will always tell you we're, we're hoping for a, a good turnout in the evening. And that keeps everybody active. And then at 10 p.m. or whatever, they feel like that was a good day, that was a good day for democracy. I'm reminded of two things somewhat humorous, I suppose. The first one, Winston Churchill has been credited with a lot of things, but he supposedly said one time democracy was a terrible way to run a country, but nobody figured out a better one. And yet, um, in, 19, in the 1980s, when Lech Valencia led the solidarity movement to be in, in, a, in a protest specifically, industrial protest specifically, at allowing the people of Poland have a vote, when they, when they first did, after suffrage, people getting elected un, and, and treated, and there's, a, I know we have a member of Fine Gael and Arkle whose father actually was elected to the local, to represent his city, town, 75,000 people, and suffered as a result, and then was subsequently elected after 
uh, political reform. But the turnout at that stage, at the initial stages at least, was over 90% because people valued it. So a vote, and Deputy Durkin has said, you should not diminish um, the electoral system because you diminish democracy. And I think we should always hold that. And, and issues like Deputy Crow mentioned about access to a, to a particular polling station and the suitability of it is something that needs to be addressed. The register has come up time and time again amongst other things and uh, you know I welcome the fact that everybody had something uh, uh, constructive to say but the general theme was the register of electors and more importantly the establishment of an electoral commission and I, I welcome the fact that in, in his concluding remarks the minister has said that the establishment of electoral commission is something that was in the program for government and that will be um, will will come about because I think we do need and it's it, it's in the explanatory memorandum I lay I, it's laid out by that that we don't at present have a commission no fixed errors of polling and no consolidation of electoral acts so I hope that today's bill the introduction of this bill, the debate that has ensued and the discussion, I'd like to think about it at times, has actually started something rather than ended it. That it allows for a, a wider discussion on the electoral system. And it is, you know, it, we all get it as politicians and even um, people who are members of our political parties or supporters get phone calls from people who've turned up uh, and they can't vote. And I mean, it really is, I mean, I had a case of one 93-year-old woman who never moved house, and she'd voted in every election almost since the foundation of the state, and she was disenfranchised in 2011. And you know, I don't know who the lady was going to vote for, but she wasn't allowed to vote, and she really thought bad of it. And her, her family had all been involved in the struggle to, to allow this country to vote. So those are the cases that we all hear about, and I think that needs the electorate. We need a body. To, to really focus on it. We have co uh, commissions for energy regulation, communications, you know, we have ombudsmen, we've all sorts of organisations. A fundamental piece of democracy is the person's, uh, the citizen's franchise to vote. And I think we should have a dedicated entity, an electoral commission established on a statutory function and come back to the rest of us, whoever's here and whoever's in government and whoever's in, in this house to actually make recommendations. It was interesting what Deputy Buttermer said about the, the Constitutional Convention. Um, had 89% wanted to extend the hours and over 90% um, favoured an electoral commi um, uh, commission. So we have, if, if we accept that the uh, Constitutional Convention was reflective of society, we have the imprimatur of society to go ahead and debate this matter further. So could I once again thank the members, uh, the Minister, uh, for all the, their comments and the, the, for what I consider to be the start rather than the end of a discussion and a debate on hours of polling and polling and voting in general. Thank you. Um, that concludes the debate and I must now put the question that the bill be now read a second time. Is that agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, the question is carried. Um, as this is a private member's bill, it must, under Standing Orders 82A and 118, be referred to a select or special committee. The relevant committee for this bill is the Select Subcommittee on Environment, Community and Local Government. Does the Deputy wish to move the motion of referral now? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lars Corla. I move that the bill be referred to the Select Subcommittee on Environment, Community and Local Government, pursuant to Standing Orders 82A and 118 of the Standing Orders relative to the Public Business and Paragraph 8 of the Select Committee's order of refer Orders of Reference. Is that agreed? Agreed. 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 If the, um, the, the, um, the hall is adjourned until um, 2 p.m. next Tuesday. Thank you.